Hello and welcome back to a brand new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. Uh, if you remember, we are still in chapter 3 of this series where we answer objections to healing. And we covered so far about 8 objections. We talked about God's sovereignty. We talked about the already and not yet theological concept which needs to be understood in the right perspective. Then we talked about Job's suffering. Then we talked about Jesus' hometown, about the failure of the disciples. Then we talked about Paul's infirmity in Galatia, uh, about Epaphroditus when he was sick, and about Trophimus' sickness uh, last time. And today we're continuing uh, with uh, the ninth objection. What about Paul's thorn? This is the, one of the biggest objections in the body of Christ when it comes to healing. And today we get to discuss about this objection. And the objection is defined in the following way. Paul's thorn in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 was a bodily sickness. And that is why God does not heal anyone anytime. That's the objection. And the answer to this objection, it's a little bit more developed because we will take our time to destroy this objection in a slow way, but consistent way. And we'll begin by saying that Paul's thorn wasn't a sickness in his body. And let's read the whole context, the biblical passage about Paul's thorn from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 10. I will be reading from the New American Standard Version, English Version, but you are welcome to read from any English translation you have available. Let's read it together. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when, when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. First of all, Let's notice that when Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh in this passage, he refers to it as a weakness and not as a sickness. And we can see that in verses 5, where it says, except in regard to my weaknesses. Then in verse 9, it says that but my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Then in verse 10, says, therefore, I am well content, content, content with weaknesses, insults. So he doesn't address this thorn in the flesh as a sickness. He addresses and he calls it a weakness. And, and verse 10 concludes and seems to, seems to describe in more details what Paul's thorn was. It says weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. Here is the whole context of Paul's thorn. And he goes forward further on and describes. He gives a description of what that thorn was. And if it was a bodily sickness, he could have called it that way. He could have said something like, I will not boast except in regard to my sicknesses. Verse 5. Power is perfected in sickness. 
I will rather boast about my sicknesses. Verse 9. Then in verse 10, therefore I am well content with sicknesses, with insults, for Christ's sake. For when I am sick, then I am strong. If the thorn had been a bodily sickness, Paul could have mentioned at least once that sickness. Isn't that right? He never says it or calls it sickness. I mean, this is how any human being would talk about a sickness or a bodily illness or a disease that's in their physical body and bothers them. You would mention it at least once. There is a sickness, it's a disease that bothers you. But Paul doesn't do that. He calls it weakness. So that's the first clue that Paul's thorn is not, was not a physical sickness. Then we see that when Paul, Apostle Paul used this phrase, thorn in the flesh, everybody in his audience seems to have understood what, what he was referring to without asking any questions. And whenever we see a term in the New Testament like thorn, like in this context, we should search it in the Old Testament as well and find out where was it mentioned the first time and in what context was that term used. Because the characters of the New Testament were accustomed with the Old Testament and its terminology. Even though Paul was speaking here mostly to Gentiles because he was in Corinth, it's 2 Corinthians, the, the church in Corinth, there were also some Jews in that church too. We know about Aquila and Priscilla who were exiles from Rome. And uh, in their house, Paul uh, uh, stayed while he was ministering in Corinth. We see that in Acts chapter 18. Then we see the church in Corinth surely must have had some Old Testament background since Paul used frequently references to the Old Testament, like the one in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1 where he says, Our fathers were all under the cloud and they will all pass through the sea. He mentioned very often Old Testament sayings, Old Testament stories. So even though he was speaking to the church in Corinth, to Gentiles, they were well accustomed with the Old Testament stories, with the Old Testament history. Now coming back to the Old Testament references of the word thorn, many times when the word thorn was used in the Old Testament, it referred to people and not to sicknesses, usually to the Canaanites or the Ites nations. And we see that in Numbers 33 verse 35, for starters. Let's read it together from New King James Version this time. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. Let's notice here a few similar terms to Paul's terminology. We see the word thorns in your sides and we see harass. They will harass you in the land where you dwell. In the same way Paul was harassed by the thorn in the flesh. And here the context is before Joshua, Joshua entered the promised land with the people of Israel. Notice that the thorns were present in the promised land of Canaan. So there was an opposition for the people of Israel and the necessity of a fight for possessing that land. In the same way, in our promised land, in our Canaan, which is health, prosperity, success, the, there are thorns, there is persecution, there are giants that try to fight against that and we need to fight to possess that land. And the thorns in the passage above were the Canaanites. Let's see two more passages from Joshua 23 verse 13. The Bible says this, Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you, and scourges on your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Again, we see thorns in your, in your eyes. Then another passage from Judges chapter 2 verse 3. Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your sight, and they are God. Their God shall be a snare to you. Again, we see thorns in your sight, and God will not drive them out, and God will not take them out. So the word thorns here in the Old Testament referred to people, to nations that were enemies to the people of God. 
So that's the second clue that Paul's thorn was not a sickness, but it was uh, mostly persecution coming from people. Now let's move on to another clue. One of the usual interpretations of Paul's thorn is that it was a remaining of his blindness from the road to Damascus, a kind of residual, a sickness called ophthalmia, also called ophthalmitis. Now let us see if that was the case indeed. And let's read Acts chapter 9 verses 15 to 19. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Here the Lord talks to Ananias, speaks to Ananias. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, he sent me that you may receive your sight that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. Let's read this again. Immediately, on the spot, instantaneously, there fell from his eyes something like scales. So if, it was, if there was something on his eyes, in that moment, it fell off like scales. And he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Now let's notice a few things in this passage. First, first of all, Jesus did not tell Ananias that Paul will suffer of blindness for his name's sake. He said in verse 16 that I will, show him, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Not that he will suffer blindness, but other things he will suffer for Christ's sake. Moreover, as, in, as seen in verse 18, Paul was completely healed of his blindness. He was healed at once, immediately. It was not a par partial healing or with residual remainings. Nothing of that sickness, of that blindness remained when Paul was healed. The Bible says that he received his sight at once. Not partial sight, not residuals, but immediately at once. Amen? If that was true and Paul continued to have residuals coming from his eyes, as some people imply, Check how strange the following passage would sound. And here I have some additions in italics and you recognize them. Acts chapter 19 verses 11 to 12. This is actually funny. Funny. It says this. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, even though he was so blind that he could not see where to put his hands on. That sounds funny, right? So that even handkerchiefs or aprons filled with Paul's eyes residuals, were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. We may laugh at this, but these are the implications, the consequences of what we are saying, that Paul had residuals from his eyes and that was his thorn. Of course, people have other crazy interpretation of what Paul's thorn may be, but I'm referring here all, only to bodily sickness. I want to kill that objection. Later on, Paul healed, we see that Paul healed all the people that came to him. And we see that in Acts chapter 28, verses 7 to 9. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us uh, courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. All from the island that had sicknesses, diseases, they were healed by Paul. He laid his hands on them and they were healed. The Bible doesn't say that any remained with his sickness. They were all healed. Let's move on. Furthermore, let's see what things did Paul suffer of 
for Jesus' name's sake. And I will go fast, but you can go back and read all those passages. First, Acts 9.23, the Jews determined to kill Paul right after his conversion. Acts 9 verses 26 to 29, he was hindered in joining the Christians from Jerusalem. Acts 13, 6 to 12, he was opposed by Satan through Elimas the magician. Acts 13, 44 to 49, he was opposed by Jews and the mob. Acts 13 verse 50, he was expelled out of Antioch and Pisidia. Acts 14 verses 1 to 5, he was mobbed and expelled from Iconium. Acts 14 verses 19 to 20, he fled to Lystra and Derbe, where he was stoned and left for dead. Whenever people were stoned, they would not survive. And we know that from history. They were stoned to death. If they did live, people thought they were innocent and stoned unjustly. Paul did die since he was left for dead. He must have died. But he rose back to life. And if you were stoned, you would have tremendous marks on your body. You would be cut, bruised, bleeding. Imagine Paul after he was stoned to death. Imagine his face. He, he must have looked like uh, with uh, his face cut. He would have broken arms, hair, hair mixed with blood, uh, broken bones, cuts, gushes. Uh, he would have been a mess. And soon after Lystra and Derby, Paul went to Galatia and preached to them in the infirmity of the flesh or bodily illness. And we saw that in Galatians 4, 13 to 14. Then in Acts 19, verse 8, he was disputing continually with false brethren. Acts 16, verses 12 to 40, he was beaten and jailed at Philippi. Acts 17, verses 1 to 10, he was mobbed and expelled from Thessalonica. Acts 17, 10 to 14, he was mobbed and expelled, expelled from Berea. Acts 18, 1 to 23, he was mobbed at Corinth. Acts 19, verses, verse 23, he was mobbed in Asia. Acts 20, verse 3, there was a plot against him by the Jews. And we see that Paul had to face so many persecutions and difficulties, like being beaten, being mobbed. He had to dispute with false brethren. He, there, was, there were plots against him. But now let's allow Paul to tell us in his own words about his hardships, about his persecutions, and about how he got approved by God. And we see that in three passages. The first one comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. The Bible says this, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. In much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Then we see in 2 Corinthians 11, 23, verse 28. And I will stop uh, where to, to emphasize those things that he experienced. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. 
in, journey, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness in, and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Look at how detailed Apostle Paul is. He took the time to repeat the word perils, I don't know, maybe 10 times? Let's continue the third passage, 1 Corinthians Chapter 4, verses 9 to 13. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring of all things until now. So we see here listed all the places where Paul mentioned of his sufferings for the gospel. Among all this, he has never, not even once, mentioned sickness. In all this passage, these are all that I found, where Paul describes his hardships, his persecutions, his uh, difficulties. He never mentioned sickness, although he took the time to describe a lot of them in detail. He never mentioned the word sickness. Isn't that interesting? I mean, if he had an eye disease, he could have mentioned something about it. He could have said something like, I've been through this and that, and not to mention this eye disease that I cannot get rid of. That's how we people are. He would have said something or something about a sickness, but he never mentioned anything about a sickness in his body. Amen. Let's move on. In verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 12, the initial passage that we read, Paul said, that the messenger of Satan was sent lest he would be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. And usually this portion is understood in the following way, that God sent a messenger of Satan to Paul to keep him humble and keep him from getting into pride. Isn't that right? Most people interpret this in this way. However, the passage doesn't say that God sent the messenger of Satan to Paul. On Paul because God is never tempted to do evil the Bible says in other places instead it says the Bible is very careful with the words instead it says that a thorn in the flesh was given to him a messenger of Satan the thorn was given to Paul by Satan himself not by God now would Satan send a messenger a demon on Paul to humble him, to stop him from getting proud? Does that make sense? I mean, pride is Satan's favorite sin from the beginning. Would he send someone to stop Paul from becoming proud? It doesn't make any sense. That shows us that this phrase, be exalted above measure, must have meant something else than pride. Let's see what else could, have, could this phrase meant, have meant. Be exalted in Greek, it's a passive verb. So that means that Paul wasn't exalting himself, but something else or someone else was exalting him, propelling him. And you know, when you receive a lot of God's revelation, revelations, you begin living more and more in the supernatural. You begin living in a different plane of life. You begin having more victories. You help people. You do a lot of damage to the kingdom of darkness. So Satan was trying to slow Paul down and to minimize the damage in his own kingdom. He was trying to stop Paul from being propelled to a higher plane of life, to more victories, to more miracles, to more damage to the kingdom of darkness. He was trying to stop him because of the revelations. So how could he have stopped him? By putting persecutions in his way. That's what I believe 
this phrase being exalted above measure meant Paul was propelled he wasn't propelling himself but he was propelled he was growing from glory to glory from faith to faith into the image of Christ he was manifesting more and more of the fullness of Christ so he was being exalted propelled uh, lifted up if you want so the more Paul knew the more blessings he had but they also came with more persecution which he was able to handle god allowed these persecutions because they would come through people with free wills as i said before whom god loved that's why god didn't take the thorn from paul because they were this thorn was coming through people that god loved and he knew that paul could handle that because of the revelation the more revelation you have the more power you have the more resistance you have the more resolve you have and you can handle more persecution and we see in mark 10 verses 29 to 30 exactly this that the more we know the more revelation we have the more blessed we are here on earth on this earth not in the future life but that comes also with persecution because someone doesn't like you to be blessed someone does and if he cannot stop you from receiving the revelations and from receiving the word of god he will try to stop stop you externally or internally and we'll see later on how he does that here he was trying to slow paul down through external things through persecution but let's read mark 10 29 to 30 so jesus answered and said assuredly i say to you there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time it says it the bible says who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life so jesus is very specific he mentions what we will receive in this life in this time and then what we will receive in the future state in the in next age so in this life we are expected to be blessed a hundredfold to have houses to have lands to have brothers and sisters but with persecutions persecutions are the only suffering that jesus calls us to endure it with honor for his name for his name's sake but not sicknesses not disease and paul was experiencing a lot of persecution because of revelations let's move on then according to galatians 4 14 paul considered himself a messenger or an angel from god that means the messenger from Satan that he mentioned as his thorn was indeed an angel from Satan or a person, but not a sickness. In light of all the above, it seems that this angel from Satan was generating persecutions and opposition wherever Paul went. He was after Paul and wherever Paul went, Satan, this angel, this messenger will stir up persecution against him and that was the thorn that paul was talking about not a sickness then further on we are never but never told in scripture at least in the new testament to ask god for healing or implore him to give us healing we are not told to pray for healing but just lay the hands and heal the people we are told in james to call for elders now how come then paul himself implored god to take that thorn away from him he implored him three times the bible says in 2 corinthians 12 verse 8 it says concerning this i implored the lord three times that it might leave me paul implored god to take that thorn but in the new testament we are never told to implore god for healing or to ask god for healing we are told to lay hands or to command sickness to go away so that's another clue that this wasn't about the sickness. Paul was imploring the Lord about something else, not a physical sickness. Another argument is that a physical sickness doesn't usually torment or buffet or harass from time to time. A physical sickness comes and stays in your body. It doesn't harass 
as Paul said about it. Then another argument. Paul received this thorn because of the amount of revelation he received. Now anybody claiming Paul's thorn should be able to demonstrate also his or her revelations. Isn't that, isn't that right? Paul wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament. And whenever somebody is ready to write two-thirds of New Testament with revelation that we do not already have, as Paul did, and that does not violate any other scripture from before, and then call it scripture, then that person is ready to claim Paul's thorn and to identify with Paul. Until then, you cannot identify with Paul's thorn whenever you have a sickness because Paul's thorn was there for a reason and it's impossible for us today to be in the same situation as Paul where to write new revelation to and call it scripture amen we don't write any more scripture the scripture was already written and then further on in all the new testament there seems to be a distinction between the sufferings caused by sickness and disease and the sufferings caused by persecutions for Christ's sake we are told in various places in the New Testament, like in Matthew 5, 11, that it is good and is a blessing to suffer persecution for the name of Jesus. However, we are never told to accept and endure sickness. We are never told in scripture to accept and endure sickness. Jesus himself healed all the sick that he met. And we know that. And fought against physical sickness and disease all his life. At the end of his life, he suffered persecution, as we know. He suffered beatings and ultimately death to save us. But he was never sick in his body. He was persecuted. He was beaten to death. He was crucified, but he was never sick in his body. God paid for Jesus' sacrifice too costly of a price that he would play now with sickness on people to teach them something. His son, his own son, paid for healing. So why would he play today and send sickness on his people or on other people and play with, dev with the devil's tools? Moreover, he will not reveal clearly in the scriptures his will related to sickness that we have been healed by his stripes as 1 Peter 2.24 says, so that afterwards from time to time to have some kind of hidden sovereign will with our lives that involves sickness and contradicted bluntly his already revealed will. God is completely able to accomplish any will with people directly through his Holy Spirit. He doesn't need the devil's tools to accomplish that. He can use his Holy Spirit. That's why he put the Holy Spirit on in us and on the earth. He doesn't play with sickness, which is an effect and a result of sin entering into the world. This is my final argument to this objection that Paul's thorn was not a bodily sickness. And I hope that by this time you are convinced that Paul's thorn was not a sickness and you are able to convince other Christians, to tell other Christians that his thorn was not a sickness and that in your mind you will never allow this doubt to kill your faith towards healing or to block your faith towards your own healing and to or towards healing others. Amen? Now let's move on and talk about the 10th objection, which is about Timothy's stomach infirmities. And the objection sounds like this. Timothy's stomach pain that even Paul couldn't heal is an evidence and a proof that sometimes sickness is in the will of God for Christians. And we'll, we'll begin answering to this objection by reading first the passage from 1 Timothy 5 verse 23 where this case is mentioned about Timothy's stomach pain. Let's read 1 Timothy 5 23. Paul gives an advice to Timothy here. No longer drink only water but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So when we read this passage we immediately see very clear that Paul is telling Timothy how to avoid getting sick so often and how to relieve his symptoms to drink some wine. The goal of the advice is that Timothy is not sick anymore. If it was God's will for Timothy to be sick and suffer, then Paul was telling Timothy to go against the will of God when he gave him advice on how to feel better. Isn't that right? 
if it was God's will for Timothy to be sick. If Paul actually believed that Timothy's frequent illnesses were God's will, then he should have been saying something like this. This physical illness and suffering are from God. It is part of his mysterious plan and he's using it to teach you something. So don't do anything that will relieve your symptoms. Timothy, if you want God's will to happen in your life, you need to be as sick and miserable as possible. Of course, that's ridiculous on many levels and the hyperbola is intended. Probably you realize that. But it does make the point that I want to say. If sickness is, is God's will for Timothy, then it would be wrong for Paul to provide medical advice. And from what we know of Paul's character, he would not be contradicting God's will like that. Since Paul is telling Timothy how to get better, then Paul must believe that it is God's will for Timothy to be healthy. Amen? And that means Paul would not have believed that God wanted Timothy sick. Jesus viewed sickness as an enemy in Acts 10.38, the Bible says. And so did his followers, including Paul. Amen? So I believe that should already settle the biggest part of the confusion surrounding this verse with Timothy's stomach pains. Timothy's stomach cannot be used to prove that sometimes sickness is God's will because Paul is telling Timothy how to avoid being sick. And I said that many times. Wholeness, health, and wellness is what Paul's advice is supposed to lead to. And we are on safe ground if we assume that Paul's advice in 1 Timothy lines up with God's will. Amen? You may ask, but why is he advising him to stop drinking only water, but to add some wine into his diet? Why is he not ministering healing to Timothy or telling Timothy to believe for his own healing, etc.? Maybe he was healed of his infirmities, but it reoccurred. If you live in an area with unclean water and you drink water that you are not used to, you might get often stomach pains. Isn't that right? However, if you use wine or some other beverage with antiseptic qualities, you can decrease your chance of getting sick. And this is what Paul was telling Timothy to do. That is why Paul is, Paul is telling him to drink wine. That tells me that sometimes some good advice on how to avoid getting sick in the first place is appropriate. But it absolutely does not tell me that sometimes God wants people to be sick. Amen? Let me compare this to something that is more common in our days. What if someone is smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and they have developed lung problems as a result, as many people that smoke do? You could minister healing to them and see God heal all their lung problems. But if the person continues the behavior that caused the problem in the first place, the condition is likely to return even after they have been healed. Some practical advice, wisdom, and common sense is appropriate sometimes. You cannot continue doing the same things that brought you that sickness. You might be healed, but then you get sick again because you live in this world. So I'm not saying Timothy was smoking, but he might have used some water that was affecting his stomach. And he might have been healed some many times, but the sickness, uh, the illness reoccurred. So this passage in 1 Timothy doesn't teach us that God wanted Timothy to be sick. In fact, it means the opposite. The purpose of the passage was to get Timothy to be strong again and to help him avoid being sick. This is offering practical wisdom on how to avoid the recurring problem that is hindering Timothy in his ministry. Amen? And here I conclude answering this objection about Timothy's stomach pain as well. And I hope you are convinced as well that this, this illness that he had doesn't give us the right to believe that God's, God wants us sick sometimes. And the final objection in this big chapter, it's entitled, We will become proud if we minister healing all the time to all people, anytime, anywhere. That's the objection that some people, some Christians bring when you are too confident or too bold. 
And that's also the devil's strategy to put you down when you start believing and having more boldness and confidence. Oh, you'll be proud. Oh, you will be too proud. And the objection sounds like this. Some might say that if you begin healing the sick on a regular basis, people will crowd around you and you will get very easily into pride or you will make yourself God or you will infringe sooner or later God's authority and sovereignty in some way. You will upset him. You will make him upset. How do I answer this objection? I have three things that I can say about this. First of all, pride manifests itself when you boast with your accomplishments based on your efforts. Self-righteousness goes hand in hand with pride. So when you base your ministry on your own holiness, on how much you fasted, how much you prayed, how holy you are, that's when you have the highest chances to get into pride. However, when you understand the grace of God, how much God did and that everything you are, everything you have, everything you do is by God's grace. You put your faith in His holiness, in His righteousness. You trust in His word. Then you don't have any reason to boast or to be proud. It actually works the other way around. It brings you to your knees. You will be grateful. You, you will not know how to thank God for His mercy, for His love, for His grace, for what He has done, for what He has given you. Because all you are, all you do, all you have is from God. So the issue that this makes a distinction between pride and faith is where do you put your faith in? What do you base your ministry on? It is your own works, holiness, fasting, prayer, or is it Jesus' obedience, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, His righteousness, His grace, His word? There's no reason to be proud when you base your faith on God's word. Amen? That's my first answer to this objection. Second, some might say, oh, pride was Lucifer's capital sin. That he wanted to be like God and he was thrown out of heaven. But you know, I will tell you a secret. If you think carefully, whatever Lucifer wanted and longed for, God has given to us. These little creatures, people, humans, he gave it to us. He made us lords, kings, priests, prophets, and even gods, the Bible calls us in John 10.34. Those to whom the word of God has come, he called them gods. Of course, we will not receive worship like God. There is a distinction between God himself and us. But it makes a lot of sense. We have his nature. We are born of God. We are born of his nature. We have his nature. We have his authority on the earth. We have the authority of gods, of lords. Satan is no longer the God of this world. I mean, he, he is in a way on people that don't know the Lord. But once you come in the family of God, he is no longer a God over you. You are a God over, the, over Satan or a Lord. Let's use the word Lord so that people will not uh, panic when I use a God. I'm not a God per se. I'm not God because he alone receives worship. He alone is all-knowing, all-powerful, but I'm born of him. I am created in his image, in his likeness. And we, if you notice carefully, we have received the position and the honor that Satan wanted. So God wanted us to enjoy this, to enjoy. He prepared the glory for us. Uh, um, he restored the glory in us. He gave us a crown of glory. He seated us with Christ at his right hand, which the devil longed so much. Nobody in heaven has this honor to stand at God's right hand. Amen? But we have it. So we have a reason to be joyful. Not to be proud, but to be joyful. The third answer that I bring to this objection is that in the New Testament, healing the sick is no longer a one-man show like it used to be in different revivals in the past. That happened. God anointed certain people in a similar way like in the Old Testament because of His mercy. Because the body of Christ as a whole didn't have enough revelation yet on what God has given us. 
but it's not supposed to be that way. In the New Testament, all believers are supposed to heal as a normal thing. And, all be- and when all believers do it, and it becomes a normal thing, there is no reason for anyone to become proud. If all of us, all the believers, begin doing these things, healing the sick, then there will no longer be any reason for us to get into pride. Isn't that right? So let's all do this so that no one will fall into pride. Like so many times it happened when one man of God started doing miracles soon after that, Many times they fell into immorality, they fell into pride, they fell into all kinds of sins. But if we all do the same thing, then there's no reason. There's nothing special about anyone. That's why the body of Christ needs to be encouraged to do these things and to be trained on how to do them. Amen? And with this, I conclude this big chapter where we answered all the objections that I could find uh, against healing. And in the following sessions, we'll continue talking about false obstacles to healing and then valid obstacles to healing. And we will cover the hidden will of God. God is teaching me something. God is disciplining me. Communion in an unworthy manner. I gave authority to the devil and that's why I am sick or I cannot be healed. I have sin in my life and that's why I cannot get healed. And that's a false obstacle. I, I'm reaping my own doings. I did that to myself and God cannot heal me. I hear that a lot. Lack of financial contribution to the kingdom. I didn't give enough. Or the sick person's lack of faith or generational curses. Or lack of prayer and fasting. A lot of good stuff. And then we'll see the valid obstacles to healing, which are fewer. Only four of them. But a lot of exciting things are in front of us. And until we see again each other, I pray that God will bless you richly and that he would fill you with his Holy Spirit with peace and joy in the name of Jesus. Amen.